Oh. Hi guys. Alva, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. I believe you did that Okay. Where's the actual camera? Right here? Yeah. Trying to see what you see, Alba. Oh, okay. Hello. Okay. Party title, I guess. Oh, it doesn't want that. Ah, oh, yeah. That's kind of hoping we can see ourselves, but. Okay. You see pretty much the whole room, Alma? Okay. Uh, yeah, I see. <laughs> Two different sections of tables. Okay. All right. I just we, we switched around the uh, layout. Yeah. Um, to make it a little. I can see part of like the head table and the one that would be to the left of it. Okay. Okay. So you can't see Kate, but she's hard right to you, so she can't. You. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. I think it's all right. I think my view is sort of from the podium or where the podium used to be. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. okay. I think we're good. Almost. I don't have any. Oh, did they come up? And you're, uh, so, Ella, can you hear okay from here? Yes, I can. All right, I'm going to turn you up a little. I got some fancy on the back of my ears going on. And there's one here. All right, I will go ahead and shut people up. I don't have there. <laughs> Input is designated for district presidents, board chair, may grant non 
residents the opportunity to address the board. Please note that statements involving certain subject matters, such as personnel, cannot be made during these public input sessions. Public input can be made in person during board meetings and or submitted by email through the link at the top of each meeting agenda found on the district website. Emailed statements will be read during the first input session at the beginning of board meetings. Okay, uh, do we have any people for public input tonight? Just so we can share. Okay, I see two hands. One of you would like to go first? My name is Jamie Weber. I'm from North Berwyn, and I'm a resident and an employee of the district. I come here tonight to thank each and every one of you on the board for your hard work. The last 19 months has been very challenging for everyone, but perhaps even more for those of you who have patiently listened to the many voices in our communities, paid attention to the growing scientific knowledge around the COVID-19 virus and experience, and considered the safest way to get our community's children back in school full time, where we all know they learn school subjects best. That is the only piece of work, that's not the only piece of work you've done. You've been elected by the people to make important decisions about our most precious resource and their education in an unprecedented time, and you've done the job. I know that I represent many others who could not be here for a myriad of reasons. When I say thank you for doing this work under trying conditions and for considering the needs of the children in school as you did this work, you deserve more than just my commendation. You deserve thanks from all of your constituents. Thank you very much. Oh. <laughs> Good evening. My name is Elizabeth Chassie. My husband, Brad, and I are raising four children in this district. And I'd like to thank the teachers, faculty, and administration for how hard they've been working for our students. I'm here tonight to address the glaring lack of kindness and respect I've seen within the MSAD safety community. To be frank, this behavior is often not only rude, but a downright racist and homophobic. This is unacceptable. I urge the administration to take this misconduct seriously. I also would like to remind the parents that our children are watching us and learning from our actions. At our last school board meeting, I was horrified when a parent in attendance made a homophobic remark about the gay pride flag. The following week, an eighth grade student was physically assaulted by a classmate who didn't like her gay pride flag. This is unacceptable. LGBTQ plus students in our district are being verbally attacked at school. They are being called gay slurs, they are barked at, and they are harassed in the hallways. This is unacceptable. This is unacceptable in our schools and it is unacceptable at our school board meetings. Parents, please do better. Teach your children to disagree without being disrespectful. And please teach your children that hateful, homophobic, and racist behavior is always unacceptable. Again, I urge the administration to take it all instances of racist and homophobic behavior seriously. Hate has no place in our schools and all of our students deserve to feel safe within their community. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on to minutes of the September 16th meeting. I call Mr. Dwyer and Ms. Dwyer. I couldn't see any. Okay. <laughs> I, you did last I try really hard. Just get right. All right. Well, I think the motion to accept that's written. I think they uh, very well written. There's a lot of, a lot more information in there that I usually just don't see. But <laughs> very appreciate to see all that noise. Good second. Oh, I'll second. Okay. All those uh, approved. Opposed. Stay. Abstain. <laughs> <laughs> to 
Do we have enough? Alma, how are you doing over there? Did you uh, approve? Yeah, you're fine. You're good. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Six. Six. All right, next is Maine School Board Association Delegate Nomination. So this comes up every year. We need to have a delegate from our board uh, to be uh, participating with the Maine School Boards Association. Uh, there is a conference coming up as well, so we can start with just the nomination and see if there's anybody that would volunteer to do that. So can I just give my little pitch again for the value of this conference? So for those who are new, I guess you're the only one here, but, um, and Elba, but um, it's, I've been able to attend a couple of times and um, I have found it incredibly valuable. Uh, there's all sorts of workshops. I haven't looked at the outline for this year, but it's everything from, uh, sessions on how to be a new board member, how to, um, you know, a lot of diversity, equity, and inclusion work. There's stuff that's um, going to be COVID related, special ed, a, a whole, just everything, the whole spectrum. And um, usually the keynote speaker is like, like mind blowing and fascinating. A couple of years ago, there was one on, um, like poverty in schools and how we don't recognize it and you know just that whole piece but also how to help kids kind of succeed regardless of that there was one year that was on the keynote was on mental health there's just it's just a very um rich couple of days of programming so i would say anybody who is able to attend i highly recommend it and then the deal with the delegate is that we need one delegate and one backup delegate. Um, that was that the point of that is to agree on the um, the uh, help me with my wording here. Uh, the articles that they're voting on. And yeah, the resolutions, the resolutions, which we have a link to, and it's. Whoever decides to do it, I can fill you in on the process. I won't bore everyone with that here. So there's two pieces too. There's the um, the delegate. So we do need someone to represent us, but it's a virtual conference this year, so that makes things a little bit more simple for folks who would want to attend. And that it's um, October 28th and 29th is no, no, 23rd. Oh, sorry, 23rd and 20th. Yep. Um, and so anybody that wants to attend can attend. And so it's, it's a lot more flexible. It used to be an investor and it was a little harder for people to get away. So, um, yeah. Does anybody have a desire? Because they're also doing one for school board chairs. Mm. Well, but that, that's a different thing. I volunteered to, to do that. I yeah, think okay. it would be a great opportunity to learn. You okay being a delegate? Yeah. Okay. Perfect. I will touch base with you after because I've done it once live and once virtually, and okay. I can I'll fill you in on. Super. Thank you. Um, why don't we? We have a Why don't we? Yeah. Why don't we just just because it says nomination, right? Yeah. Right. So somebody would like to make a motion. I'll make a motion to nominate Kathleen and have our delegate nomination for the um, school board. Appreciate I'll second again. All those in favor? Oh, there is the ass up there. So, no. No. So just, I mean, I think for the actual conference, like more people can attend. So I don't like Elva and I, I'm drawing a blank on who else we're missing. Victoria. Yeah. So I don't know if they, if they're interested, but. Mm, yeah. yeah. So Jen can sign up whoever's interested and then you'll get the license and all that. So. Put me down as a baby if you would. Okay. I, I will re, I'll forward the link just to the conference information and to all of you. I put for the, for the chair. 
So we just need to update you as to how we have determined um, how we're going to try to spend the $4 million that was allotted us to the American Rescue Plan. Um, that is basically we spent, we, we took a bunch of time working with all of the schools, talking with um, parent, parent teacher organizations, um, staff, the whole bits and pieces of it to try to figure out what's the best use of the funds to support it. The money that is um, allocated to us, 20% needs to be set aside for educational recovery. So we've got some pieces on that. And then the bulk of it actually we're doing things like um, ventilation and really um, windows, window repair. So the, the funds are being sent out, I'll just break it down. A little more clearly for you. We specifically got four million. We did. Well, yeah. yeah. Throughout and yeah. Um, so our um, what are the parameters for? Uh, for the, no, but okay, I was just going to say yeah. this time they um, wanted the focus on educational recovery. Mm -hmm. And the continued ventilation yeah. and air quality. Yeah. So those were the areas right. I focused. Yep. Yeah. So we so we actually are focusing specifically on um, math, increasing math coaching throughout the district because we've done a lot of work on the literacy aspect of things, providing literacy coaches for the district. Now we're focusing alongside that with our increased um, support to our math, so that we can raise up our um, just. The, the increased quality of math education in this work. That's a big piece of it. We also are doing a focus on um, social emotional learning. We've had a lot of, it's been a difficult 18 months. Prior to that, we still had some issues anyways. And so we're really focusing on trying to help bring our students sort of to that level playing field in that aspect of things. And um, let's see, did you get here? Um, so, but the major funding is going to um, the ventilation systems throughout the district. We're going to upgrade um, the ventilation specifically at the middle school because that is in the dire need. And as well, um, we're going to be looking at all the Honeywell controls that were put in. It's been about 15 years since all the Honeywell pieces have been put in, so we're going to upgrade those as well throughout the district. And then we're going to do window replacements in Fuzzy, Northbrook Elementary School, Hanson, and Little Nose. Take this right thing and do that. So, with this money, is there a potential of continuation of expenses without revenue? So I know we're looking at hiring staff that after this year, after that four million months. So it's gone, a it's a three year cycle for this. Approve that budget. So the, the funds are good for a three year period. We what we put into place we're hoping we'll be able to be able to, that we will meet the needs that we have within those two two to three years based on that the, the presentation. Um, and then we may have to make some decisions about whether or not these are things that we want to continue or not. Um, but our goal is to set a good ground and to be allowed and to be able to move people to a place of um, where we want to put those positions. Can we make sure in the budget process that those positions are identified? I know that's not allowed for four million money versus. Yes. Yeah. And that, that'll actually be a completely separate package, similar to how we do with like our special education local entitlement or our pieces with the, um, the ESEA funds. It doesn't even sit within the budget itself. So it's not, and I'm asking this because I'd love to, uh, on my end, yeah. say, say for granted, the government gives you money. Yeah. You have, you know, you buy your first position, you pay so much every year. Yeah. You know, the percentage is different, and at the end, it's all you. Right. And and that's, these are a little bit different in terms of the everything's, excuse me, being paid strictly through the grants, and then we have to make some decisions at the end of that period as to whether or not this 
they have met their, their goals, right? Because our goal is not to, to add necessarily, but to, to shore up everything. And then I have to make some decisions about where, where we are. Yeah. No question. Um, the other piece that I think we've talked about or have been asked about what um, expectations are asked of us in order to receive these funds regarding um, PPE and all those pieces. We do not, there, there are questions that are asked of us regarding are you implementing the safe standards that um, are, are recommended by the federal government regarding safe schools. So masking is a recommendation, you know, and, and all of those pieces. So just just to put it out there, it is not mandated. We don't receive the funds because we mask. But we do check off that we do follow the safe funds. So I just, just want to clarify that for everybody. Uh, so this is really just informational for you guys to know that this is where we're, we're focusing our funds. And we'll talk about it again in the budget season. I mean, you'll see some of these things that have been maybe on our list of, um, particularly in the buildings, like in terms of our, um, kind of thing. yeah, our facilities piece. Just to say if we can take that piece off of our facilities because the ARP funds are going to come out. I think it's important for us to have a breakdown and when we get into our facilities yeah. and finance committee, they really like a spreadsheet that shows us where that money's going. Yeah. My two cents is I just, I, I do, I worry about, you know, the, still the recovery from the last couple of years. And I just want to make sure that we are, you know, if we have the opportunity to, fund some help for that sooner rather than later. I would, I think that, I think we have a, a, a short window to sort of catch that before it starts to become a more permanent thing. So I just, I'd like to see us do as much as of that as we can. And, and one of the, and, and that the social, emotional and the academic. Yes. So, and there's a piece here that I, I didn't talk to you about, but it's, um, we actually have someone working, our goal is to have someone working specifically on after school programming to support that. It just enriched programs to bring kids back up to speed because we have had such a lengthy, um, sort of gap for our kids. So any and all areas to support to bring students back to the table um, and increase their, get their skills back on board. Do we need to vote on, oh, I mean, once you come up to plan specifically? Um, we can, it's, it is actually um, set to go in terms of everything. So you can vote and say that, you know, you guys approve the, the funding on the ventilation system, on the windows, and on the um, educational recovery projects. That would be great. It's, it is an actual total of four million eight hundred uh, four million eighty five thousand eight hundred ninety dollars and eighty seven cents. Mm -hmm. That's a lot. I'm not even personally like to see it before. Well, I can start. With <laughs> I'd, start with I'd like to see it before we vote yeah. for it, but I, yeah. I mean, I think have we gotten the money already? It is in the pipeline. Yeah. In the pipeline. Yeah. Okay. It's a reimbursement. Model. Yeah. It's what? It's reimbursement model, so we have to spend the money. So we make the application, they approve the application, and then as we spend funds, we ask for reimbursement. And it's, I mean, this obviously is uh, informational for you all, because we've done two other of the ESSER funds um, already. So, but I'm happy to share that with you I'm actually going to post it on the on the website, it's on our website as well, just so that people can see it. Uh, it's always good to do. Okay. So we'll vote on that the later day. Yeah, yeah. that's fine. Okay. Oh, right along with that. That's a timeline. Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> Denise is coming up. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Um, so I can't actually believe we're talking about budget, if I'm being perfectly honest. Um, our audit for fiscal 21, uh, the last part of the field work for the auditors begins in a week and a half. 
and uh, we're working on getting our hands around 22, and here we are going with 23. Um, so I believe Sue handed out uh, the timeline to everyone. I also think, I don't know if this is true, Chris, I'm going to try to present the board meeting. You have to join the board. Join the meeting. Yep. There she is. Amy, you're going to need to do the same thing. <laughs> I can help you. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Hi. All right. Um, so actually, we have kicked off this fiscal 23 budget season already with our administrative group. We had a, a meeting on, on the 28th of September to do some goal setting and um, a general overview of what we were looking at this year. Um, so that's really the beginning where we, all the cost center managers really try to start focusing on what next year might might look like and what they might need. They're looking at, you know, facilities, they're looking at staffing, they're looking at all of those things. Um, the next thing, uh, the week of November 29th, that's the next big thing for us in our timeline here. It's when all the cost center managers come in and present their budgets to me, Sue, and Audra. And again, we have a a litany of questions that we'll, we'll go over with them, again, addressing things as, such as projected enrollment, staffing, facilities, um, anything else that, that they've come up with that, that's a need. Um, revised budgets are due um, back to us. So after that meeting, the, the cost center managers go back and anything we've talked about that they need to follow up on, finalize quotes, anything like that gets done in the month of December. And December 22nd, they are to submit their their final version of their cost center budget. Um, Friday, January 28th, that's when I have to have taken all of these budgets, put them into our financial software, uh, process payroll, estimated medical expenses, all of that. That is um, That goes to Audra on January 28th. Um, we take a first look, the three of us, at, after everything is put together, the big numbers. What does it look like now? How much is the budget looking like? We receive our subsidy information on February 1st, and we will also have a cost center meeting with um, all the administrators on that date just to just review and revi revise our budget. By the February 11th, we hope to have our first draft budget finalized and have the, Feb the budget binders that you get each year with all of the cost centers and all the tabs to you by February 18th. Or excuse me, yes, February 18th. Um, we then have February vacation. This is always a tricky time fitting in the Facilities and Finance Committee because we get the subsidy relatively late in February, like February 1st, we need a little bit of time to work on the budget after that to see where the revenue and expenses are falling. Um, this year we talked about, um, let me back up. Last year we had some presentations to this committee during um, February break. And in our conversations this year, we're feeling kind of like people actually need that break. You, as well as the cost center managers, the principals, people need to take that time because they get so little of it. So what we thought we might do is present to the Facilities and Finance Subcommittee the week of February 28th, the beginning of that week. We can work to define the times and times of day and what works for everyone. Um, but we're thinking that that presentation during that period of time would be a good time. Thursday, March 3rd, Audra would present her budget and turn it over to you to be the board's budget. And we would also have the budget workshop Q&A where you get to go and ask questions of all the cost center managers. We then follow that up with four weeks um, of budget discussion, focusing largely on what the big topics for the year are. And we want a final draft um, for approval on Thursday, April 7th. 
Um, after that, the information goes to the attorneys, and the following week, um, the board would need to have another meeting to sign the meeting warrant and call the budget validation referendum. That's those sheets where everybody signs in the same spot and they have, you know, a multitude. I think we did it electronically this year, so we may be able to do that again. Let's see. We then deliver the warrants to the three towns. We have the digit district budget meeting in the in the it says the gym. That's a typo. That should be the theater, I imagine. And that's Thursday, May 26th. And then the vote by the public is on June 14th. And I'll refresh my memory. Is this the year we're going to take the hit on the state subsidy? Did they, did they push it out so we didn't lose as much last year? No, I think what happened this past, it, for fiscal 22, yeah. the governor increased the amount she was sending to schools because we had already developed our budget and the amount we were receiving was not planned on. That's the money we returned to the three towns. So I anticipate next uh, fiscal 23 is going to be the second year of the biennial budget for the state. So I anticipate that the 55% would remain. Um, so I don't, at this point, it's very early, but at this point, I don't have anything that's telling me that that's going to be reversed. Sounds good. Are there any questions? Okay. Did we, I think I'm trying to investigate, would we update the committee? Sorry, right. we update the committee and stuff? We do need an update to this, this committee. Right? Currently, it's Lynn and Travis, and it was Joanna. Yeah. We need, so, we need to bring somebody else in here. Or if you decide that you want to stay there or not. Right. We need Trying to do one from each town. Yeah, that's right. Wait, wait, wait. Are you interested, Stephanie? <laughs> not that I'm not interested. I'm not well, sure. It's more me. Yeah. And it's it's okay if it doesn't. Yeah. Like if you're if you're not is able it just to that one? Account? It's okay. The first, I'll say the first year I think it was just two of them. Yeah. So it's, it's totally okay. It's just. Because it looks like here it's only that one meeting, but we must have other meetings. When had you guys been, what was your meeting schedule like? So it is, for this aspect, remember it's facilities and finance. Yeah. So for this aspect, it's that one week we meet two or three days. Yeah, it was like two half days, yeah. I think, and last we're, year. We're legit half days. And that was when? The 28th of February. Yeah. And then we do have the building aspect of it. Well, actually, the building committee is a different one. Yeah. Because you're on the building committee one. Yeah, that's yeah. the construction yeah. Two committees for some of them. Yeah. So. Uh, can you, like, put me on the B list? Uh -huh. For the finance part? Like, I would be, if I can, it's just a long way off, and if I can make it work, I would be interested. I don't know who's... And also the half days is it's the March 10th through the March 31st. That's yeah. right, but that's like uh, what we're looking at. If, if no, so that has nothing to do with us. That's, that's the board. That's the board. That's the board. So, it's, so it's the week of the 28th is the is. only is the only week that the committee is involved oh. separately. So and it's a couple of half day meetings. It's a couple half day meetings. Yeah. Okay. I thought it, okay, I misunderstood that part, even though you just uh, it, said it. Yeah, the so 17 point was is our school would be in The March part is the one that I couldn't, I might be helpful with on for a couple of weeks. Um, if Victoria doesn't want to, we need love and I can do with that. Okay. Yep. I'm willing to keep doing it, but if somebody else from our girl wants to give it a try, I think they're fine with that. All right, lots of time to come. Thank you. Thank you. We lost schedule there. All right, next we have legislative updates for you. Oh, she's doing still? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. Is the other email we got? Yes. The DLG one? Yes. yes. That's this. 
we just printed it off. Oh, okay. Now I'm left. So, Elva, you should have gotten an email with this document in it. Okay. I'm having trouble trying to go to the file type. I just saved it as. Okay, thanks. Ready? Okay, so um, as you all know, there have been hundreds and hundreds of pieces of legislation in the last year, um, and they affect the district in many ways. This one is um, uh, a change in legislation that affects um, what's called a participating local district. Um, it is, uh, if you go to the, sec the second page, the first page with information on it, what is the PLD? So the PLC is an optional retirement plan offered by the Maine Public Employees Retirement System. Um, it's offered to those staff members that do not qualify for the teacher plan. So Maine State Retirement has um, a plan that teachers must belong to, and they take a percentage of income and it goes toward their retirement, and they do not contribute to Social Security. Um, Administrators, most administrators, um, all principals, superintendents, food service, adult ed, those people all are required to participate in this plan. Um, in addition to ed techs two and three, and then you have other administrators such as um, the technology director, the facilities director, me, my staff, we don't qualify for that plan. So the district, many, many years ago, decided to offer this plan for those members that couldn't qualify for the teacher plan. In the PLD, the employees contribute to this plan in addition to Social Security, and the, the contributions are on a pre-tax basis. Um, currently, um, employees contribute either 6.75 or 7.5 based on their age. They have two different plans right now based on retirement age. And these earnings go directly to a plan in their name. The percentage that they contribute is determined by uh, the main, the main re retirement system. They cannot say how much they want to contribute or change it. If they participate, they, tell, they, they contribute what the retirement plan makes. Similarly, we are assessed a fee that goes to the retirement system and it supports the benefits that all for all that participate, but it does not go to our employees' accounts. It's not a match. It goes to Maine State Retirement to support the administration of the plan and any other expenses that they have. It's, we don't get a, um, a report or anything as to what it goes to, but it goes to them, and then they decide how to spend it. So um, just, that's an important note. It's, it's not going, what we pay, that 8% is not going to our employees. Um, if you go to the next page, how do employees join the plan? All new employees are given the option to join this plan if they meet the requirements based on their position. So as I said before, certain positions must contribute to the teacher plan and others are qualified to participate in this one. They're given detailed information when they complete their new hire paperwork, and they have, we'd like to see them within a week, but they have up to 30 days we can allow them to make their decision about whether or not to join the plan. The decision to join the plan is a one-time irreversible decision as for any time they work for us. So if they choose not to participate, then they can never join in again. And um, if they leave and come back, they are held to their prior decision as well. So it's it's a lifetime irreversible decision. Um, similarly, if they participate and they come back, they still must participate. And you cannot opt out. You can't join for a little bit and say, you know what, I don't really want to do this. So the changes. There was a uh, legislation re recently that allows an exception to the one-time election requirements that does not conflict with federal law. This new law permits any eligible employee who has declined membership to have another opportunity this November. 
to participate. So basically they're giving these employees the options to say, you know what, I've changed my mind, I do want to participate. Um, the, there are some of the differences, the contributions for these employees joining under the exception would be made in, on an after-tax basis. So normally when you contribute to retirement, it's pre-tax, so the government doesn't tax you on it now, they tax you on it when you take it out of your retirement plan later. This would be taxed now, it comes out after the fact. So it doesn't have that preferential retirement treatment. In addition, um, if we uh, adopt this exception, starting in fiscal, tw or starting in 22, probably November, there would need to be an annual open enrollment opportunity for anyone who still declines, who has less than five years of service. So you have up to five years on a rolling basis to say yes or no. And once you make, once if you did that in year three, then it's still binding and it's all the rest of it, forever. all the rest right. of it's the same. It's, it's three, you have five years to say yes. Can you open unenrolled during that time or is you it cannot. only enrollment? It's only to get in, <clears throat> there's no getting out. <laughs> there's no getting out. And you said um, that the money is now gonna be cast. It's, yes, yeah, so what happens is you, um, when you have pre-tax expenses, you don't pay federal tax on the amount of um, deduction that is a pre-tax. So if you contributed to the 403B plan option we have in the district that anybody can participate in, or um, if you contribute to your main, the teacher plan, it comes out, so you have your earnings of 1,000, 100 comes out and you're taxed on 900. In this case, you would be taxed on 1,000 and then the 100 would come out. Um, is that just for the people that are joining now? Under the exception, yes. Yeah. So we na would now have to keep track of two separate lines, pre-tax, after-tax, and have to, um, it's all a manual process. So spreadsheets about how many years of service, when did they join, what year are they in, how many more do they get? Like, it's, it's a complicated, Thing just to make sure we don't miss anybody, right? That nobody slips through the, the cracks. So, so is it like a Roth IRA where you are not taxed at the end at your tax at the beginning? Um, I don't. My guess would be yes, because it's considered after tax, and that's usually this is a, um, the only way the IRS would allow this mm -hmm. is if it was after tax. So my guess is yes, but it doesn't work like a like a Roth IRA in that what they do is they count your years of service still. They, they, it's almost like a quasi-retirement plan, but it runs alongside Social Security and is a little different. Um, it, unlike a Roth, you don't put aside um, $10,000 and then the $10,000 they pay out to you and you know, $200 a month. Mm -hmm. They take your three highest years of earnings do some calculations about longevity and things like that and come up with a, a money an amount for you. So it's, it functions a little differently and I'm not exactly sure in all the fine, you know, the peculiar, the particular details. If somebody left and came back in a different role? It depends on the role. So again, if they qualify for the PLD, then they have to maintain whatever choice they made. Okay, regardless of, okay. If they were, if they left after year two and came back in year four, they would probably be able to still have a year to say yes or no, like one open enrollment period. Um, so, and I have a question on the cost. Okay, so next slide. Okay, I'll let you go over it first. Yeah. So, um, Similar uh, to um, the main state retirement system where we have to contribute a, a percentage of people's pay back to the retirement system, the state has to cover the employer side 100%. Um, years ago, maybe eight years ago now, I'm not exactly sure, um, we started having to kick in a certain percentage for those people. Similarly here, we, we contribute um, toward this PLD 
retirement plan. I included the, the um, increase in rates just to show you that it is not a level thing. You don't get charged 8% and it's 8% for a long time. Um, most years it goes up, some years a little bit, some years a little bit more. Um, and then what we try to do is in the next chart is try to ballpark what our exposure might be if we adopted this plan. And the trouble was it's based on wages. So the 8% is a charge to wages. So we have, you know, the range of wages here. So what we tried to do is break it down by category and come up with an average wage based on these different um, employee roles. When we did that, we got an annual cost. So we took the average salary and took 8% of it to come up with the annual cost. Then we have the number of members that are eligible to join but have not, they declined the first time. And so if they were to take advantage of this um, exception, we, this is the potential cost. But that, that's basically the 8% of the total. Correct. So if we had all 126 staff members who qualify but do not yet belong, potentially a $350,000 cost. And it would be, this year it would be only part of a year because if they elect to do it now, we've already had a couple months, it would be like two thirds. Um, but it would be something that we would need, depending on how people enrolled. If they all enrolled and we signed them up, then we add that to next year's budget when we're budgeting for payroll. So, but it's not retroactive, it's they just get paid from now on. Correct. Yeah, and this is legislation, so this is not optional, right? Like this is no, happening one no, way or the other? It, this, is, um, this is an option. And what had to happen is the main state retirement system had to approve this exception. So their board said, yes, we will allow the school districts to decide what they want to do. And the next step in order for this to take place would be you would have to approve it for our district. If you want to take this and put this into, you know, in place, we would need to do a formal vote and I'd get some wording and we would do that next meeting. If you don't want to implement this, then there's no action to be taken. So this is really one that you get to decide how you want to, how you want to proceed. What, do you know off the top of your head what percentage of eligible like the, this is these are the eligible employees who have chosen not to enroll do we know what our percentage of enrollment is of all eligible we have 55 currently participating which is a person out of what so it's like one third if you add everything up right Approximately. yeah let me uh, so this potentially this represents the other two-thirds of eligible people in this pool so we have 181 people that qualify and 30% participate. Are we contractually obligated to do any of this at all? No. Okay. I, I would say this, I, you know, everybody has given the option up front to participate. And um, we also have a 403B uh, retirement plan option that they can contribute to in addition to the many options that are outside of school. Um, one of the reasons people contribute both um, to 403B plans through the district, for example, is because it comes out of their check pre-tax. This is a So, even, and all of these people are plan. eligible for that? Yes, every single person in the district is eligible. I don't know a lot about the maintenance costs of these plans, but 8% seems high, having none of that go as matching. Right. It's a, it's a similar concept when we get grant funding and we pay people with grants. I think the percentage we pay is somewhere around 22%. So we do, we, you know, we, we pay for positions out of grant funding when we need to but ideally we're doing other things that don't have that percentage attached to it. This, I mean, I don't know what it costs to run such a plan, but um, I, I would agree that 8% that doesn't directly help our participants 
is um, is allowed. But I also don't think how is that fair? Teachers, administrators, whatever, have to participate. Mm -hmm. So they have a different plan, though. Right. For ELD, you don't really get a pension with access to medical coverage and in your like a real retirement plan. Um, but they but they don't get a second chance. If right, they are required to participate. participate. Right, there is a rule uh, that they must participate. I'm just wondering where this is coming from because these all these people were eligible to sign up for it when they were first. Right, hired, right. Mm -hmm. And we don't know the backstory on them. Right. About the legislation, yeah. I don't know the backstory of the legislation. Yeah, that's, that is. I think it's a little bit um, out of timing because we just negotiated the contracts and. We did not incorporate this into the negotiation process. So, so this doesn't, you know, again, the teachers, for example, that were just that just finished their negotiations, don't participate in this portion of it. They are required to participate in another plan that's offered by Maine State Retirement. This is really for um, uh, AFL CIO members, that union with the custodians and the and the drivers. This is um, central office staff. This is technology staff, um, the food service staff, um, and EdTech ones actually um, are are under this plan and not the other. Is this a one time? We'll only see this right now. We make a decision, yay or right. right now. So we're kind of over it, or is this something that could come up again through the contractual negotiation aspect? No, this. Um, this is one that you have to implement by November 1st. Where is it gone? I believe it's gone. It's not it's something not a lot that they're, they're looking to <laughs> perpetuate, but they're giving you the option now to decide if that's something you want to do. I think they were already given the option. Yeah. Well, plus. They refused it. There's other options that they can take advantage of if they want to. Uh, that's and for that eight percent. That's a big impact to our fiscal budget for eight percent. It doesn't go to them. Plus, that would be a little bit different. It doesn't go to them. It goes to the state. So if we vote it in, it's here forever. Uh, so the next time. It, right. Exactly. Yeah. And it again, it, it requires us to track these people individually. Um, put the put in open enrollment. Yes. Give them the information. It's not just. Hey, do you want to sign up this year? You would need to provide documentation, give them information about what the plan does, how it works. Like it's it's an open enrollment care where you have to uh, provide lots of detail. I assume that they are, I know how in depth you are, I would assume that they are, <laughs> that this is your one and only chance to sign up for this. Oh, yes, yeah. when, they, when they're hired. You go do it, you're done. Yes. Yeah. Because it is irrevocable, it's one of the things that gets pointed out specifically. Um, unlike medical insurance, where you can decide now, and if you know you decide in a year you want to join again, you can. Or if something happens and then you have a major life um, activity, or a, you know you get married, you have a child, you you can change your plan at that point as well. This is different. What I saw this guy had to was. My work, well, mm -hmm. uh, I could be president. I mean, that's what I said. Was the legislation is being implemented? Uh, so, no, so this is a two step thing, and in order to, for it to be in place, the Maine State Retirement Board had to approve it, and the local school district boards have to approve it. If not, then it is not. Uh, not accepted as, a, as um, an option. So a majority of local school boards or like? So not every school board belongs to, has a PLD. For example, Marshwood does not belong to the PLD. They did not sign up. They don't, I don't have one at all. When that happened, I know that in 2006, we were already under a consolidated PLD where they kind of had us all in a big group, anybody that had signed up. Um, the any districts that are part of municipalities like Sanford or Kittery, Portland, they have to do whatever the city does. So that may be that the town of Berwick is doing it, therefore you have to. Or you have to offer it anyway. Um, I think I have talked to, there was a, a thread on the business manager listserv and 
one of the business managers, it was Adam from um, Auburn, he was asking, what is everybody doing out there? There were three responses from school districts that were from very far away that said they were doing it. They were smaller schools. He got no other responses, and I haven't had anyone return a call to say, yes, they were doing it. The most I've heard is that if they're part of a, a, you know, a city, then they are waiting to see what the, what the city councils decide. Yeah, I would struggle with the... I mean, I think it's good that we offer this plan. I just kind of struggle with the cost, given that that doesn't go anywhere in the district. <laughs> right, right. Would love to be able to help out employees with that, but. Right. So there's no matching. And it's, and, okay. and it's in addition to Social Security. So it's, you have to contribute your seven point six five percent to social security and or to FICA and you have to contribute um, seven you know six and a quarter seven and a half percent top of that and you think there's about 130 people who aren't on the plan now but do you have any idea who might be interested well so what happens is this is this is taking a snapshot right now what happens next hiring season when we hire 70 new employees it means we add whoever doesn't join at the time of hire to a five-year open enrollment cycle. So that, you know, it just, it, this number is, is big, but it, it can grow. It seems like a strange piece of legislation. What are people feeling as far as you want to vote for it? Wait till next meeting? My recommendation not to move forward with it. I'm going to vote on her, not take action. I would say them as well. Great. I think um, the administrative burden of having all this be manually done, and um, we had a chance to do it before. And the state's not funding most of it anymore. Um, and, you know, just that's a lot of money out there. Which is... I feel confident that we have retirement options for everybody. Um, and in addition, again, everybody's welcome to do things on their own, whether it's a Roth or an outside uh, annuity or whatever it is. But, um, you know, again, the 403B plans, for example, offer to everyone regardless. You all could join the 403B ranks if you like them. Um, <laughs> 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 I'm that. Would you like to uh, contribute? <laughs> um, but yeah, so, you know, again, I, I think I am feeling the same. Um, not that you need my recommendation, but none of this money goes to our employees directly. And, yeah, it's just a convenience fee. And like, it just, you know, you could have, you know, zero people of these 126. Everybody could say no again, but every, five, you know, you have to kind of keep it rolling. And new people come in each hiring cycle. And where it's coming after the taxes, in theory, they could take the 6% and put it in the account and still the same thing. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And be more. Still get back on that later. Still good. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to bring it to Alba. I'm waiting. To Alba. Oh, okay. Alba? Hi, Alba. Hello. What's, what are your thoughts? Uh, I'm still thinking, to be honest with you. <laughs> I, I had some of the same questions about um, do we know who might want to, you know, uh, up even though they've said no in the past and we have no way of knowing that not really i mean we i suppose we could ask but it's not so, it would be something where you would want to give them information so they can make a decision even a, like a, a survey might not give you accurate results because they don't necessarily have all the information we're a time sensitive crunch here yeah, yeah. three-week window we have too okay. 
Yeah, that's a small window. <laughs> I would rather, if, if we want to help out the employees, give them something directly that they can put towards their retirement rather than the next labor negotiation, we give them some percentage just for that. I mean, they wouldn't be required to use it for saving, but. And that, and that would be a huge administrative. Yeah, I think that man hours to track this are going to be crazy. Yeah. Just as, as you know, each pay you have to make sure that the that people who are supposed to be pre-tax are pre-tax and post-tax is post-tax. So it's really <laughs> deep diving every payroll in addition to the annual um, open enrollment. So this this three hundred. K figure does not take into account any additional labor you might need to, to manage this. No. Okay. We, we're, we're sponges. We're stuck it up. <laughs> well, I think we're in agreement. So. Okay. Pass. Okay. All right. Thank you for your time. Thank you. If you ever found out who initiated the legislation, I'd be interested. I, let me see what I can find out on that. Yeah. Thank you, Denise. Robert, thanks. All right, our comprehensive emergency plan update. We have some law school supervising by October 1st. Um, we are collecting all plans, updated plans from the schools and departments. So we report that out at the board meeting following October 1st, just to provide information to you that um, we have received the plans. We don't share the plans because they are safety-related plans and they have confidential information in them. Uh, so to date, all schools have submitted their annual concurrence page, which talks about the changes they have. Uh, the middle school, because they were not housed in the middle school last year, has something, they have some um, areas that they're gonna focus on this year as they go through. Uh, safety and some of their committee work. Um, and we are still waiting at this point in time on our transportation safety plan. Um, it's been a little um, busy in the transportation department, so they're, they were focused on getting students to a school, covering bus runs, so they're looking at their plan right, right now. So that's where we stand as far as our safety plans go. Um, there's there. Sure. We just don't can't see them, but they're up there. Yes. Right. Right. Educational programming. Okay. We've asked Amy to join us to provide us with an update, and we have a few other updates to share as well as presentation. We did share out our presentation earlier today, um, just so you have it. It may be easier to look at it on your computer than see it on the screen. Oh. It came via. Uh, I shared it via. Yeah, the, it went out as a Google, I think Google slide. Yeah, so it says 10 7 21 board meeting. It was shared as a Google slide. Nice is on it. Travis is on it. Well, that's the PLD plan. But it feels like a more of a relaxed thing. Oh, no, I guess the did you get that? And Amy, you're joining? Alba, are you there? Yes. This is the, this is in an email. What does it look at? Are you going to share your screen, Amy? I'm trying to. Oh. Oh, it's a little too good. So, what is it echoing? I hear it echoing. You need to mute. Turn my volume. Yes. 
There you go. Okay. So I am going to kind of mirror the last presentation that we had to give updates on each slide. Um, also give a COVID update, um, kind of like across the state, again, how we focused in state level, county level, community level, like last time. And then also uh, we looked at our vaccination rates last time. We'll go over that again. Uh, we'll talk about uh, outbreaks in the district right now, what that means, and then also do another piece on pool testing. So here we are still in red, high community transmission across the state and pretty much the whole country. This is our case trend over the duration of the pandemic. As you can see, it's, you would like to think it was a predictable high, low, high, low. We wish we could kind of keep scrolling and see what the future has for us, but we can't quite do that. So, um, I mean, as of right now, looking right at the edge of the hill that we're currently in, it seems to be somewhat leveling off, but kind of looks like it wants to go down. It's hard to tell, but that's where we are right now. This is the table from the uh, main CDC, which shows the case rates for the past two weeks. And unfortunately, the last time it was updated was on 9.30. I think they updated every two weeks, so it's almost a couple weeks old. And we have had a little over 5,000 cases confirmed cases in the state of Maine in the past 14 days, 646 of those belonging to York County, which is about 12.8% of the total. I believe we were up near 20% the last time we were here. I'd have to look back at my notes. This slide is also from the Maine COVID website, uh, their vaccination dashboard. According to this, 74% uh, of eligible residents in the state of Maine have been fully vaccinated, up from 71% since the last time we were here, with about 65 and half of the total population being fully immunized. Then we can zero in on York County. <sighs> Our eligible population uh, is about 74% 74, 74 fully vaccinated, up from 70%, and 64% of our total population is fully vaccinated. Again, the only uh, eligible age bracket is those age 12 and up. Here are our three, three communities, their current vaccination rate. Lebanon, 56%, up from 54 since the last time we saw this slide. North Berwick, 82%, up from 79%. And Berwick is at 57%, up from 56%. And Lebanon and Berwick really are still the only two towns in red in the state. I think there might have been one more. I'd have to go back. There might have been one more county way up high. But yes, you're right. Uh, the dashboard has also added a feature of their vaccination rates for youth by SAU. Uh, SAD 60, we are in the 45 to 49% that, well, and it's not fully vaccinated, it's those youth who have received at least one dose. That has not changed since the last time. So was that just in the eligible? Children, 12 to 18. And then, this is a new feature that we talked about was coming, and it's here on the main state vaccination dashboard is the breakdown of school employees who are fully vaccinated. And this is our page and also central office staff. They categorize them separate. 
and this was tasked to districts from the DOE to collect this data. Central office staff send out a de-identified survey once a month where staff members respond to the survey, are you fully vaccinated, yes or no, and what building you belong to. There is no proving of the answers through this method. And then moving on to what our cases have looked like for the month of September. And I put a side by side of what things looked like a year ago, September 2020, and what they look like this last month, September 2021. In 2020, our, the date of our first case in the district was um, on the 18th, and then this year it was on the 5th, starting from when school started. We did have some summer cases. Those were mostly athletic in nature. So this is just the beginning of September 1 when school started. Um, in September 2020, for the whole month, we had a total of three cases. Last month, we had a total of 47. 42 of those were students, five were staff. In part, we have a lot more people back in our buildings. And the cases across the state were a lot higher than where they were a year ago. Our schools currently in upright status are Noble High School, Noble Middle School, and North Berwick Elementary School. Our next slide, what does outbreak status mean? So outbreak status is determined by the main CDC once a facility, so a school or a business or other entity has three or more PCR confirmed cases from different households. So two positive siblings wouldn't count, that would only count as one household case. And those cases have to be reported within a 14 day period. So if we had two positive PCRs at the beginning of the month, and then the next month we had another couple, they wouldn't meet that criteria. When talking with the CDC and in the SOP, a school outbreak does not necessarily warrant school closure. It can be evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis. What would most likely cause a school closure for the CDC to recommend a school to close would be if they were concerned of like one area of the school, say um, one classroom, at 15 positives, they might say, whoa, 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 we need to pause, we need to take a look at this. Last year when we started this adventure, we were, a lot of us were under the impression, once you hit outbreak, you close down, two weeks, go remote. And as we trudged along, they're like, oh no, that's not the case anymore. You guys can stay open, you just keep distance, you keep masking, you keep cleaning, all the things. So what, in that case, like, outbreak status it's doesn't really mean anything. I mean, they, if they want to keep you under a little bit more of a microscope, I'm not quite sure, but yeah. And it's, they are the ones to call it. In the back of my head, I've got a, another school that I'm like, hey, that one might be coming down the pike, but I can't, I'm not the one who can call it. But yes, we just keep doing things, and here we are. Uh, I think I forgot to mention, but the SOP had been updated. We're on number eight, version eight. And that's standard operating procedures? Yeah. That's what that SOP stands for? There was, there was some shifting of sentences, paragraph structure. They eliminated some of the tables that were unnecessary due to restructuring paragraphs, but they also changed the table that we had viewed last time, which broke down the exceptions to quarantining. This is a more user-friendly version. At the top, 
you kind of choose where the exposure happened. And then down the left hand side, you see where you fall. Are you fully vaccinated? Have you had COVID? Are you in a full testing program? Or are you is your school universally masking? I do think it's a little bit more user friendly for sure. So is this version number eight? <laughs> yes, it is. Um, can we post this on the school website? Because this answers a lot of questions. Yes, yeah, we've sort of been asked. asked. Sure, we've sent it out a few times, but posting it. Yes, so we'll put it in the minutes of this meeting as well. Yeah, so that this is good. And then again, I think these are some things that we've reviewed already about pool testing, how it's run, who should participate and can participate. And so what are we offering that? We haven't yet. We are we put out another survey was the last ask that we had. That survey went out. I don't have the results of it, but I believe. We talked about it at the last meeting, and it was very similar number-wise, percentage-wise of participation than the first one you sent out. It's still 30% anyway. Right. And they also changed, the state changed it. Now we don't need to necessarily have 30% commitment. Right. Well, we don't. No. Huh? But to make it worthwhile, the more the merrier. Um, so if you only have a few per class joining, it only really places those individuals in the exception bracket, I think it's exception. And with, with, I believe the majority of the respondents were still not on board or interested. So, are we not? I can't figure out why. I mean, I don't understand why people wouldn't be on board, but that's not for me to figure out. But as a district, I don't know why we wouldn't offer it to at least the 30% that were interested. I don't think we ever reached the 30% threshold in each building, the first or second survey. No, we did not. Um, 21% or one of the schools, and where the second survey wasn't much better. Um, in the name of public health, it makes perfect sense to detect asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic cases that we wouldn't normally have caught. Um, in the name of education, it makes sense to help keep kids it makes in sense the class. To keep kids in class for those. It would only be those again participated. So. I just looked back last week, we had 407 responses, 53% said no, 46 said yes. Right. So we're, is that not enough? That was only out of 407, but... So it has to be 30%? It, it doesn't have, we don't have to meet that threshold anymore. But again, if two kids per class signed up, it would only benefit them, which isn't to say it isn't a good benefit to them. Um, it's not doing what they what they intend for it to do. It's and we don't think that a it would keep them in school and it would keep them able to play a sport after school, but they would still need to quarantine when in the community. So no going out to eat, no playing an outside of school sport or activity. The not saying I agree with it. <laughs> Um, there would be it packaged up in a nice box. It does seem like it would be a seamless um, venture and surely beneficial. Um, across the state, there's been many uh, speed bumps, I would say. Um, there, was, there would be a staffing issue. We would need to hire someone to begin the program, maintain the program administer the program. There's a confidentiality issue that's been, that has happened in several schools. Of course, if there's a positive pool, the next step is that that classroom, that pool, each participant needs to be tested with a rapid test. And 
there's been some experiences in the state where um, there's no way to keep confidentiality. You know, one student doesn't make it back to class, they pack up their things, they leave. Um, this well, is they would have to anyway if they tested positive. Right, but they wouldn't be in school and then boom, tested positive and then had to leave. But now I know that. It's either now or tomorrow morning when you don't show up to school. I mean, it's not. <laughs> I, I understand. No, it's I, just, I, I actually, I mean, I don't. Completely transparent with the good, the bad, the ugly. Yeah. So it doesn't come as a, as a surprise. It seems to me that people that are unvaccinated and play sports and want to keep playing sports would want to participate. To me, that would be a driver, I would think. But. Right. But right now, as you know, according to the chart, the vaccination is the golden ticket to not have to quarantine in any of the circumstances, home exposure, school exposure, sports exposure. Right. We have the lowest vaccination rate in the state for a district. But people also don't want to quarantine or step out of sports or school. So the reason why we included this slide is we know we have an ongoing conversation about your, your feeling and your recommendation about pool testing. That's really why it's back up here. Amy's provided the confidentiality has come up for a couple of districts. Um, there is a staffing piece that would likely have to go with this because our nurses are very taxed in the schools. The younger students, it would just have, they'd have a learning curve. So you definitely need some guidance and support in addition to teachers. Um, we have heard that um, while some of these companies say that they're going to be able to support with staff, sending staff, it hasn't really happened for districts. Some it has, some it hasn't. Um, there's really been no pattern of it's the early group that signed up that gets the support, not the late group. It's, it's kind of a mixed bag about where support's coming. So, uh, you know, you've expressed an interest in exploring this. And so, so that's the update that was for that. Right. And as Denise pointed out, our our vaccination rates are as a district are low lower than some of the other districts is there any plan to have any clinics in any of the schools vaccine clinics yes we had the two i believe already i'm working on having a regular employee uh, each building is nurse is kind of orchestrating a, a flu clinic for our employees and then also we will be open to more COVID vaccine clinics. I do know that the Sanford location, the mass vaccination site that was open over the summer, they reopened yes. as well. So that's another close um, site to go to. They're, they're only open on Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. Okay. Tuesday is from 1 to 7. Tuesday to Thursday is from 1 to 7. And Saturday is, I think, it's 8 to 4. As well as local pharmacies close by in Maine and New Hampshire, they've got it, right? A Walgreens, CVS. But yeah, of course, and then another thing to think about too is when the younger population, it gets approved for them about having vaccine clinics offered for them as well. Have we had any sports teams affected? by positive cases of Catholic teens now quarantined or we have. Yep, since school started we have. Because it's rampant in Sanford. Yeah, as I far know. As sports teams go. Just got a text saying how many cases Sanford has had recently and it was up in the past how many days in Sanford High? In three days they had eleven positive cases. Just at the high school. Since, just at the high school since Tuesday. Yep. But I will say this, I noticed a lot of kids got vaccinated up to the first round. Of course, they're not fully vaccinated yet, so the second time it happened, it had a quarantine, but kind of uh, forces some of those families that if you want to do sports, you know. Right. So 
looking at kind of what masking has done to help us in quarantine wise. Now let me pull up a high school situation. So a situation where we had 35 total close contacts. 26 of those were masked in a classroom. So nobody had to miss class or be out of school. 10 of those individuals were already vaccinated, so they had to miss, miss nothing. And then out of that 35, nine were bus exposures, which lands us in a different category. They would have to quarantine from everything, but two of those individuals were vaccinated, so they didn't apply to them. They could stay home. And then for what it would look like in the elementary level, we have so a case at an elementary school we had nine close contacts. Four of those occurred at lunch, so that was a full quarantine. Five of those were in class, so last year we would have had to go remote with the whole class. Now we zeroed in on a six foot radius that included five close contacts, but we were masked in a classroom, so they still get to come to school. And let me tell you, there is no software for COVID in schools. This is my spreadsheet child. <laughs> Are we seeing uh, transmissions within our school? Like, are these cases, are we cracking them back to the old say, are you, you were exposed and now you got it from our school? Most of it is, I speak with the parent and she's, it's funny because they'll be like, I just tested positive. I'm keeping so-and-so out. And then two days later, we find out the student's positive. So a lot of those conversations, they, the families know kind of who they got it from outside of the school. Um, there's been one case that uh, two positives were close on the bus. And I know where one of them kind of probably got it, the other one. So it, it's hard to tell, like you don't know where you picked up a head cold or, you know, but. But that's actually the very first one we've had. Yeah. And then we haven't been able to tie it to a community versus an in-school transition. And these are just my observations, yeah. not the epidemiologist, so yeah. Yeah. no one has said to us you have transmission in your school. Thank you. So I guess I don't want to push the pool testing conversation, but it's come up a few times. So do you want to have a more thorough discussion right now and make a recommendation or continue to consider that? I feel like I'm on my own on this one, but I, I mean, personally, it, it's, I don't understand why we would, I mean, I would want to see us do it and continue to explain that, you know, here's how it works. Be very transparent. Um, here's the process. Here's the commitment, and here's the you know the potential benefits. Ha just have to do with catching it early and time in school and on the field. And I, you know maybe we give it till Christmas. And if we really don't have any increased participation, then we shut it down. But if we do, I, I just I I feel like with the low vaccination rates, especially, it's just an opportunity. It's just another tool that we have to keep kids in school more and participating, which is my and goal. To, but to boost the vaccination rates. Well, that would be ideal. But that priority yes. number one. Absolutely, one hundred percent. Absolutely. So, on the other side, I. Uh, what we saw from last week, but I was saying with the numbers, it means 200 people are interested. <clears throat> that spread between everywhere. I don't think it's worth the time to do it because we've only got such a small amount. I don't see, a, it's been two sets of things being put out for this. And if the numbers slow that low, I just don't see the benefit in it. Um, you need a larger group of people to be able to show anything other than individually. 
um, which they can go through the pharmacy and get that test. Um, I just don't like the idea of, of having to get an extra person on staff to do it either. And I like that this year looks more normal. That feels very different. <laughs> Well, I mean, it's not normal if you have to quarantine. <laughs> I think there's an important aspect, and it's kind of thinking back what you're saying, is the amount of participation that we have. Yes, I like the fact that we offer it to people to be able to do it, but it comes with a cost. So if we do offer that, but we only get five people that are interested, but we have to pay for somebody to do it, yes. is, it worth, is it worth paying this person to do this job for five people to be involved? Thank you for saying that. I, I think that's kind of where I'm up on it. I would love to be able to offer another tool in a toolbox for them, but it just, the pros versus cons, you know, it doesn't seem to balance both to me. Right, it only works if you have the maximum amount of Do we know for the people that responded, do we have any idea what age group the kids are represented at? Uh, It's, I mean, I don't have it broken down. There were, of the- Ballpark. Of the no's, 71 at this one are elementary. Well, I'm more interested in the yeses. I don't think yeah, the no's. Hold on, but it kind of goes both ways, right? <laughs> so, um, So I'm just going to give you by the schools because it'll be easier for that. Okay, let's look at um, school. Uh, Twenty. Who said yes? The Milton School. Uh, 17, he said yes. Uh, Lebanon Elementary, Hanson, so all of them left. 20, he said yes. So those are, and then I'll see if I can find them. That'd be yes, really quick. Then the rest of them will be up here. Or, okay. Uh, 31, he said yes, 31 in North Park. North. North Park Elementary, so K-5. <laughs> and then, so the middle school was 43, who said yes? And the high school was, oh boy. Um, oops, sorry, hold on. <laughs> I will take it away then. Um, 60. <coughs> Who said yes? <laughs> so I wonder if we moved oh, to oh. offer it. Okay, and then yeah, I'll run off the case, right? Yeah. Go ahead. <coughs> Sorry. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, I wonder if we moved to offer the testing. If we get a different reaction, then do you want to do this? If you said we're offering this, mm -hmm. you are welcome to sign up. I wonder if that would be a different response than uh, a response to a survey. Problem is to offer that. It's going to increase her workload, and she can't increase her workload. She'd have to hire somebody to increase that workload. So we're going to hire somebody on the chance that people might be interested in doing it, and if they're not, then we terminate them. We're not going to find a way to work in a position like that. Alvin, did you want to say something? Yes. If, if we were to pursue this and get the ball rolling, rolling, could we do it? without hiring someone additional and as more people perhaps were to catch on to that then look at hiring someone the onboarding process is one of the most labor intensive pieces of the puzzle and we would we don't have the availability for that to even start it 
have you talked to other schools that are doing it to see if they've hired someone? Because I, I know there are schools that are doing it successfully. Yes, yeah, there are some schools that have hired additional staff, and there are some who have not. Uh, it might depend on student population, workload, um, uh, students, students mm -hmm. medically fragile students. That it probably depends on a lot of things. What are going on in a building? If it's doable for a nurse or a team, I know that some administrators probably play a role in some schools. Um, there might be teacher champions who jump on. It's different in every area. Who would actually be administering? The, I know the students would be doing it themselves, but would it, would we be looking at the teachers orchestrating it every Monday morning? In the classroom setting, the teachers are most likely the yeah, administrators overseeing the process, making sure the right students are the only ones swabbing themselves, collecting the tubes, labeling, and then they get collected by another person school-wide for the bigger packaging and paperwork side of it. So would one person actually be enough to cover the whole district? I don't know. I feel like maybe one person would start off as the administrator and have to figure out consenting, how many consent forms um, are obtained and input into the system, and they would have to figure out scheduling for each building, different days of the week, sh shipment dates, and then the... Um, the, the the data processing piece of it as well. There would be more than one person, mm -hmm. but there would be one person who would have to start from square one and delegate out. Would this person have to have a medical background, or could it be a, an, an administrator, a program manager? Necessarily, that would have to happen. And again, at, at the point it would get to having a positive. Pool, I do believe the, the school nurse would have to jump in and either train or do the Binax Now rapid test administration in the classroom. Uh, again, taking them away from the students that we need to serve on a daily basis. I think it's a good tool. I think logistically it's not a good option for us. There is a, another option of just sending home to every single student a form as opposed to the online survey and just saying, are you in or are you out? And then following up from there. Because we, we truly have not had. Um, a real representation of the whole parenting world, honestly. It's not something, you know, I'm not trying to be, I don't, I'm not trying to belabor this, but it's just a, there's that question of would we actually receive the um, more interest if we were actually directly sharing with those similar to what Kate's saying, you know, do we put it out there? Not that we're starting it, but that this is it. We need to take a final decision, yes or no, would you be involved? Because we've only had 400 responses. It's not like the entire district. I mean, we could put it out there and say, if we have over 30%, we're going to do this. We need a response, yes or no. And then it would start whenever. And if we get the 30%, we proceed with staffing and do it. And if we don't, then. We could just be a little bit more passionate about it instead of the problem. Do we have grant money or anything that we could pay for it? Um, what was your question? Grant money, grant. I was wondering if it could come out of the COVID, the uh, four million. Probably not for the windows. <laughs> no, I, think, I mean, there is, there is certainly uh, wiggle room in some of these that we might be able to do something with. And it's, uh, we're, I'm not, I'm not going to say no to that. I think we could probably try to work around something. I'd be interested to see too how long it took across the the grade levels because I keep thinking disruption too. 
like I said, I mean, I know this year isn't normal, but it's closer to that and then something like this. I feel like, uh, at least at the elementary grades, you know, they're going between their, their extra subjects and, you know, especially over to lunch and recess, and there's so many different things that, you know, yeah. jolts their day, too. How much time do you think you would need to um, onboard somebody? Well, hiring currently has been a challenge for many positions, so I couldn't really say. Yeah, that's, that's, a good, that's a good point. We, are, we still have a lot of openings that are not filled. And it took us quite a bit to fire for our nursing position recently. I mean, that's just the reality of, right. of the, yeah. everywhere across the board. The timing of it, world is short, so yeah. I think the timing of it would land us to when all of our students are now eligible for the vaccine, which is a golden ticket out of any quarantine. I'm just oh. that. <laughs> They're going to have to get vaccinated. We're, we're close to the point that 5 and 11 will be having enough to be vaccinated. <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, yes, it's just are our people? rates are not. So at that point, yeah, I mean, I guess the people that want to participate and do it for the quarantine reasons can get vaccinated and. Well, then I would participate, have the choice to get vaccinated or quarantine. Yeah. Well, do we want to vote on it now? Send out papers first and then see? Or? Right. I mean, do you want to just collect more definitive information for the next meeting? We can find out, we can talk to some schools, some of the elementary schools, to see how long it's taken now that they've been doing it for a while, how long it took when they started to get that information, and then do a paper copy, yes or no uh, piece, so we can come back with those pieces of information for the next meeting. I think that's a reasonable approach. I think it makes sense. Yeah, here's a question. It, like, say uh, younger than 12 is eligible to be vaccinated tomorrow. Uh, do they, are the kids also looking at having two shots? And so would quarantining be after the second shot? So are we still looking at a few months? I believe it's going to be a two-dose series. It's just going to be a reduced dose for that age. And then it would be the two weeks after your second dose that you would Two weeks be after? Fully vaccinated, yeah. Sorry. Okay, but the two doses are how far apart again? For, for Pfizer, it's 21 days. So well, Pfizer is the only one that's going to be uh, an option for the kids. Okay, so it, my point is that either way, we're still a couple months out from under 12 year olds being fully vaccinated. Right, but you're also on the way a couple months out before we can even win full testing. You're going to be well, we can we can post an anticipated position. Yeah. Now. Doesn't mean we have to hire. Right. Right. I think it's worth collecting more information. Because that's such a good tool. I agree. The way things are now, we don't have enough participation to use it. But I think it's worth collecting more information. Thank you. So I, I would just say, Amy, Sue, and Audra, what do you guys, do you guys have a recommendation? You're the ones that are in the school every day. <laughs> there's, <laughs> there's, a, so, let's just be honest. There's a ton to it. It's an additional piece of work, honestly, just to be, just yeah. to be fair about that part of it. Um, I look at Amy, we look at Amy every single day and what we're dealing with right now, add, adding to that plate is not something we can do. So that's just the reality of it, and that's across the board with all of our school nurses. So we really just need to be thoughtful in what else we're asking. Um, again, I'm happy and to, what the like, payoff to is. ask the questions, but the reality of it is, is, is this really going to benefit us in the long run? I don't know that. And, I, and when we sit in, your, in the superintendent meetings, 
so far, I don't know that it's actually made a huge amount of difference for them. So we can talk to them again tomorrow morning, because we talk to them every Friday, and maybe we can get some feedback that says, yeah, it makes a difference. I don't know that it, I don't know. I, I don't know. Thank well, you. The piece that the nurses would, let's be honest, the nurses would have something to do with this along the way, even when we would hire, and especially going into the rooms, financing the positive pool. Um, this year, I can't even describe the um, the workload that our nurses are facing right now. Um, it's, you know, in a normal year with our normal visits and our, our, our normal medically fragile children, which are getting more and more, that population is growing. And then adding the COVID, not only the, you know, the, the contact tracing, um, the phone calls, it's the, the answering of phone calls and emails from parents, which we are more than happy to be some voice of compassion and help for these families who a dad's been hospitalized and going on the ventilator and what do I do now? I can't even go see my husband. How long does my son have to quarantine from school? It's, it's, um, it's a lot. They're hanging in there. They're doing an amazing job and I'm super proud of all of them. So I just want to say that. Well, maybe it sounds like you just keep us posted, see what I would be in favor of sending home the sent emergency income people to fight. I would hate to, you know, some parents that that want this to happen and have to explain to them why we're not doing it. And they get sick, you know. But it's still very serious. Even with young children, they can get very sick and have permanent long-term effects on them and you know I still agree we should do everything we can find find stuff earlier like this. just me yes and in the name of public health that is exactly what it, the intentions of the program is supposed to do find cases early isolate and get them out of class This is sort of a related question, but with the work level that you and your staff have has right now, um, do you need more help just anyways? <laughs> yeah, so we have, um, we had filled our float nurse position with an exceptional nurse and she had an accident, broke her ankle, oh. you know, unfortunately for several weeks wants to come back as soon as possible and I will find something for her to do if I can. Um, we have two substitutes beyond that with other jobs so you know availability isn't on a short short term notification is an issue but we rely a lot on our principals on our secretaries and on our teaching staff to pick up where we leave off. We train them in what we can to keep an eye out for our kiddos that need it, for sure. Worked hard on building those relationships with our coworkers. So more substitutes would be great. And our float nurse is typically based out of Lebanon because of the two physical buildings and there being a lot of staff. Pop the population here, there is pretty high. Um, so when our float nurse is not being utilized elsewhere for a nursing absence, she's housed at LES. And that's been a big help to Taryn over there, who she's she's got a pretty heavy load. Having a, another body over there might be helpful too. But Well, right now, too. See what they come back with. Final decision in two weeks, remember? 
that we'll just keep this a part of our regular update and Okay. Thank you, Amy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for what you do every day. Mm -hmm. We just wanted to, similar to last year, just provide updates on attendance, uh, attendance, just for your information. So for staff attendance during the weeks September 27th to October 1st, uh, we had a low of 88 percent and a high of 94 percent attendance. And then this um, October 4th to October 7th, we had low of 90 percent attendance with a high of 94 again. Our student ranges for the two weeks were um, a low of 86 in a building or two and then a high of 99 percent in attendance. So we'll just keep presenting that information and just, it, you know, it's important to, to share that. That's what we have for the educational programming piece. Do you, do you have a last meeting I asked for an update on graduation? I have that under other business, but I can do that right now if you want. No, it's fine. So now we're on to um, employment. Sure. So we are are nominating William Barry for Noble Middle School Special Education. Um, he had, is coming with a master's degree from Southern New Hampshire University and a current or previous position, I know you did oh, yeah, yeah. at Center for, uh, the Center for Autism and Developmental Disorders. So that is our newest uh, recommendation for you for a teaching position. We have to vote on that. You do need to yeah. vote. We need a motion and a second. Okay. Do make a motion? I'll make a motion to appoint uh, Mr. Barry as our middle school special education teacher. And second. Stephanie? Yes. All in favor? Thank you. Okay. And then we have one resignation. We'll also need a motion on that. Elizabeth Mulcahy, who is currently the behavior interventionist at North Brook Elementary School, and she's resigning for personal reasons. And bringing that forward tonight for you are approval. All right, I'll make a motion. <laughs> <laughs> and second? I'll second it. Um, all in favor? <laughs> Thank you. I I have another and I um, this is something that uh, if I can if I'm getting the history of it right uh, sometime like right before COVID so when Steve was still here um, and Sue, this may ring some bells for you. So there's somebody that I know from outside of school world. Um, his name is Michael Bartner. He works for Revision Energy and he, I believe, met with you guys. Um, it's basically they're putting solar power plants in for school districts around the state. Um, and he, <laughs> got in touch with me sometime last year. It was all a blur. I said, Michael, this sounds great. I can't do this right now. <laughs> um, and so, you know, we sort of kept in touch. And um, I would like to have him, he really would like to present either to the board or the Facilities and Finance Committee. I mean, personally, I'd like to hear what he has to say. It kind of strikes me that it might be similar to the gentleman who came and talked about lights for the parking lot. And so he did just get back in touch with me. I would love to just either say, yes, come to the, come to a board meeting. You've got 10 minutes or put him in touch with someone. But just as a quick, um, I, I, I'm not going to do the, the summary justice, but basically they have small solar farms around the state, um, that you, you sort of, they're like small local, um, cooperatives almost. So we're not buying into it, although there, there is a, another option if you actually have land that you want to put 
panels on, that's another option. But the, the main option that they're looking at different school districts, I believe anybody that participates is within a, a pretty small radius. Um, they recently got Biddeford, Rumford, Brunswick on board. There's, there's school districts all over the state. Um, He's using Biddeford as an example that they are going to save over $58,000 in the first year and over 20 years, they'll save more than 1.3 million. There's no upfront cost. I don't, I mean, I don't know a whole lot more than that. He did give me the whole thing, but I, I haven't retained all of the details. So, um, I'd love to either have him come and present to the board, the whole board at a meeting or, um, to a committee, he. It sounds like when he met with Steve or Sue, he he did reference you. I don't know if you were part of the meeting, but um, that, like, I guess Steve was interested, and then I mean, this was literally like February twentieth or something. Oh, February ninth. Thing. It literally. Yeah. Please, is this this is a different person than who we've been talking to, correct? Correct. I would say I've been contacted by. Um, a number of people when they opened all of these solar farms, or some sometimes they are rejected to open, right? Like they want to get people to sign on before they actually do it. Um, this is one of the one of the people that has reached out. Um, we were also chatting with another uh, gentleman who I forget where he works out. He lives in Acton, um, and they wanted to take a more in depth view of it. Um, with the main regional service center, we've been having some presentations from some folks about the store and, um, you know, there are differing opinions about walking in the district for 20 years. And some people say there's no cost, there's no downside to it. Other people are hesitant to do it. So there's a, it's on the surface, it seems like a good, a good thing. I just, I haven't, I honestly had time to dig into any of it. Which is why it's, you know, over a year later and I'm still haven't really given him a solid answer because there's some other things that we kept having to do. Yes. <laughs> but but I would like to, you know, I, that's interesting. So should I put him in touch with you? I think he may, maybe it was you that, I don't know. I wasn't involved in the front end, right. like a year and a half ago. Okay. I would say I've received emails from other people offering things um, and what I really, I tried to do is we got in touch with this gentleman from Afton and he gave me a presentation on it, but I, I honestly don't have time to like know it. Yeah. And yeah. I must sign the district up for something that I'm not aware of, like all the ramifications. And so I have pushed him out a little bit yeah. to say, we need to get into this, but with the regular operations with the COVID stuff, with the 10, you know, up to... How many ten COVID grants that we're dealing with and school construction? I just didn't have time to dig as deep as I would like. Yeah. So this might be actually something that we our facilities and finance group could talk. No, that was my first thought. Was like maybe a first pass. Yeah. Because I, as I'm looking at your original email from February, um, I have that information. Denise, we were all Denise and I and, and Audra were all on it. Um, and then we have this other gentleman that we've been dealing with in some other capacities. And they're all, there's all these angles for all of it. So I think if we can talk about it with the facilities and finance committee to say how deeply do we want to get into all. Certainly solar is a great way to go. We're certainly not wanting to stay no to it, but like it is, it has been a long bit. Yeah, what? It's been a little busy. Yeah. So I know. So hard, honestly. We, we've talked about, we actually pushed this last gentleman out, we're like, look, we're just going to do what we need to do for the next year. Yeah. Give us the time. Well, I mean, so we can't yeah, and that I, that's absolutely like, that's what I keep telling him. Like, I, this seems great. Yeah. Nobody has the bandwidth right now. Yeah. That is, that is an so aspect of should I, what should, should I, what are you guys, what so are you? Go ahead and just send them to, send them to me. Okay. And then we'll, we'll send the circle wagons a little bit. Okay. Great. Um, thank you. Well, I have been informed that on Tuesday night, the North Berwick Board of Selectmen, well, 
going to close the bond issue. Uh, how much of an effect that's going to have on the vote, I don't know. But um, the reasoning was um, they're not saying that all the, the only, only improvements in the Lebanon school are great, they're fine with it. Um, but they think that, I'm kind of terrified, afraid, I don't want to speak for that one. But the way it was explained to me, they think that if we just had done the Lebanon school by itself, then that would have given the district enough debt that, that we would have then had um, more state funding the year after. And we might not have had to get as much bond. Mm -hmm. And they're concerned about the, how much it's going to increase or grow in property tax. Mm -hmm. So, what? And I'm, I'm wondering what would happen if that does they don't like. I don't know what the other board of selectmen are going to do or if they're planning to take a position on it, but um, Lebanon pretty much has, yeah. They, For themselves, even. Yeah. For me, yeah. Yeah. Say, I'm sorry, say that again. Lebanon, what? Lebanon, there are certain people on the select board that are not going to support it. And have voiced that. What's do they have a plan B for the schools? Let them go, just let them fall in. And we haven't heard anything from that. We definitely have space issues in addition to. Uh, facility issues at Lebanon Elementary School. So if it doesn't pass, we will certainly be needing to have a community again and uh, start coming up with how to address those concerns. North Berwick has no space. Um, and yeah, and we're going to have no space. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah, we're, we're up against it. Yeah, no question. Okay, that's why it's all free. Yeah, it's all free because Lebanon has. Uh, a building that's fallen down, and Burrow and Mulberg have that building that don't have enough space for our kids for within the next year. We'll probably have enough space for our kids. So they don't, they don't, they, they're not saying this work doesn't need to be done, but it, maybe it could have waited one more year or something. I don't if you I know how much it went up, do you know how much it went up between the first year we had it? Yeah, well, I think the started out not as high, and then within a year it went way higher, and within a year it's probably going to go even higher. Yeah. I think this is about like accessing. It's it's a strategy. Like I think their their belief is that had we looked at one town only, the following year we would be we would qualify for state support. Uh, because right now there's no there's and whether that's accurate or not it's hard to tell because there's there's a nice long list of like you know. go ahead and ahead and just um, clarify that a little bit so i spoke with scott brown who has the construction side of things at the doe and the state <clears throat> um, i believe the last list of approved schools was fiscal 18 so three years ago there is not even an application to get a school on the next list yet. He anticipates he would con commit to this, but when I said another two, three, four years out, he said that's probably right, before there's even an application. Once you submit an application, it takes about a year for the state to vet it and get you on the list and then approve it. So you're looking at probably six, seven, eight years before we could even potentially qualify. And he wanted to stress how many school buildings there are in the state. And with limited resources, even if you think your building is in bad shape, they have buildings that from the 1800s that are still on the list. So um, it's just, it's, it's a longer process than just in a year the state yeah. will have money. Yeah. And I just want to make that, that's what I was told when I was investigating that. Thank you, Denise. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's not part of our reasons for trying to put it. Like we have to just, we're running out of time and we're going to end up incurring costs. Oh, Whether we do it or not, <laughs> we already have. Yeah, we're going to incur more because we don't have any more space in our schools, and we're putting more trailers around our schools to make yep. space in our schools. And that's an annual cost that we are just throwing money out the window for. And we worked on that. Yeah. <laughs> we just, uh, Kevin Moore just found out that if you have a thousand square foot modular mm -hmm. or uh, building that's temporary, you need to uh, sprinkle it. So that could be. Which is new. I mean, new ish. It's coming in a year or so out, but you know, we've never had that before. They should. You know, you know, modulars. The modulars don't come with them? No. Yeah. And then some, like if it's more the Burwick you're talking about, you have to run the lines. So what's the usual square footage you want to do? Well, so if you think about, what do you think, North Burwick, the, the, the cottages, or the one that's actually at the Hussey School, that's, what do you think, Charles? Oh, do you remember? You don't remember, do you? Denise? I'd say it's probably like 20 by 40, maybe. I don't know. I think it is. Uh, it's probably 20 by 40, so. Yeah. So that was, so what, what Kevin was thinking is is we're either gonna have to figure out the sprinkling aspect of it or we put smaller modulars in and have a little you know, little trailer city instead of using larger ones. The cottages are uh, granddaughter, so they don't have to be, but those would definitely have to be sprinkled because they're they're bigger than that. So yeah, there's just a lot more um, and then that yeah. yeah. And then if you don't have that, the spread the water in there, and they're further out from the school, then you have students further out from the building if they need to use the bathrooms. Yeah. So there are some safety issues and concerns yeah. with that too. Yeah, well, there's a lot of pros and cons, and that's kind of why our recommendation is to go for it. Because yeah. If it doesn't pass, then. And we did. I don't feel like we're using our money wisely because we're going to be throwing a lot of money out. The we window. did talk about. Yeah. Yep. You know, just doing one building. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And but you have to have the whole district approve it. Mm -hmm. So if we're just doing eleven and why would work in North Burr go for it? Well and I, I and it would pass. So North Burr feels strongly the North Burr selectmen have talked about it and we've had talked to the guys. They keep they feel strongly that if they supported Lebanon, that they wouldn't at the time would support Lebanon because the need is so great there. Um and then again it's this whole prop they in their thought processes is that that would provide us to, the ability to get on the list. But as Denise has explained, the list is actually not even existent at this point. It doesn't look like it will be for a couple of years. So that just pushes everything out. Right? And, and we can't afford to wait seven years for the population of those tasks. Oh, I'm full. My connection <laughs> on the board is the patients usually say that about all the grant stuff and they know what they can get and what they can't get, but yeah, it's it's I get some really very different perspectives about going forward, that's all. And I think we have to do what we think is best and then hope that the voters will support us. And if they don't, we'll have to like figure it out again. You know, it's like if this is a constant constant thing. From the get go, the price is outrageous in my mind. Yeah, yeah. But a lot of that price is out of our control. You know, yeah. A lot of the market, the market value on a lot of things has increased drastically just from when we started. When Steve was here when we started this, I want to say the figure was 30 million, but I don't remember off the top of my head. That's the number that's both focused in my head. Yeah. And now we're at 50, and that was just a year. You know, and COVID definitely hurt that process. And I mean, it's going to cost so much just to do the one school, the price for the other two. It's going to be, I, I don't even see that being feasible. I think the project was, if we get the approval in November, the project would start. I don't think it would start next summer. It wasn't. It was going to be, I think, 23. Yeah. yeah. By the time that we be able to get started, I yeah. had to go through all the process of bidding and planning with the planning boards and all that stuff. So we're looking at least a year out 
already? Yeah. Oh. I mean, there's still the possibility that we have to throw some money out the window for um, cottages or something. Yeah, just some extra. Mm -hmm. But yeah. at least we have an idea of the end, and the end of the tunnel. Oh, yeah. If this passes. So. If it passes, yeah. Hopefully it passes. Hmm. Can we send in flyers out or something? <laughs> yes, they're coming. <laughs> And then we've got a hearing on the 21st of October. Yeah, we did three, we went to each town and did three things. I went to two of them and the participation level was not high. No. Nope. You know, one of them we had none. Right. Um, and then the other one we had, what, two, three? Outside of us, I mean, it was probably kind of Probably. Lebanon, 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 we had the largest. Yeah, yeah. And that's the one I didn't make right. it. Yeah, not that easy. Anybody else have any others? Yeah, <clears throat> sorry. Uh, how is it going for the masking breaks across the grades? Right. So you know that everybody's definitely right. taking right. time during well, the day. We made sure to just send out communication to encourage the masking breaks. And what I would say here, it's so nice to see them outside. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's really nice to see them outside, but the weather has been great, so that they're taking breaks. And we have not heard there have been any issues at any of the schools with, with breaks. We haven't heard from parents that there are issues. We haven't heard from students that there are issues. Um, so I think that that has been addressed. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. So I think transportation, just an update on transportation. Um, I have just a few things that Linda wanted to share out, and we have a driver who will be fully licensed sometime in November. So that's really great news. We have a number of drivers who um, are dealing with some health issues at this point in time. We have a few that are out for medical leaves, and those time periods vary depending on um, the situation. We are starting activity runs on Tuesday, November 2nd. We usually run activity runs much earlier than that, but it has been very difficult to um, figure that all out with all the shortages that we've had. Prior to schools, two weeks before school started, two drivers resigned and one of the bus monitors had. So that caused us to have the incredible trouble that we had at the beginning of the year. So that pretty much everybody in the transportation office or in the garage that were certified to drive, we're driving. Yeah. So Brenda was driving, everybody was driving. Yeah, the mechanics were driving, um, Jeremiah was driving, Brenda was driving, everybody was driving. Right. Uh, they needed to address some of the shortages by um, consolidating and deconstructing one of the elementary runs in Berwick and stop reassigning those students to different buses. And then they needed to add a shuttle to the middle school. Uh, so that's currently what's been happening. They're actively continuing, actively searching for drivers. Uh, their, Brenda is particularly concerned because the licensing uh, changes at the federal level um, and with training up, mandate more uh, training necessary. So she's very concerned with that part and how much longer that's going to take to train candidates or anything um, that comes in for that. Said, um, she said that Wednesday we had a little bit of uh, just timing adjustments that we needed to do with the late start of the release, which we always have to do. She feels like that's going really well at this point in time. We have had a lot of trouble the last three weeks, I would say now, getting our athletes to games. And we have charter buses when we've been able to. And even at that point, um, Aaron Moore, Lauren Shane, they've been spending just days on the phone trying to get buses. And are putting one right. of the vans and driving teams. Like, yep. the yep. 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 Um, parents have uh, been asked one or two a few times to drive um, their students to a game. We really try hard not to do that. But when there are no charters, I mean, we have exhausted everything from CJ Trailways and Portsmouth. Have you tried other schools? We yeah, have. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So they're just yeah. So it's it's definitely a work in progress. Uh, 
hopefully, you know, just with that, with the constancy of the, the advertisements out there. I know Brendan was on Facebook. There was a Facebook post with parents uh, expressing their concern about the fact that we didn't have transportation and they had to bring their students to um, an athletic event. Brenda got her on a Facebook page and just said, we really need help. If anybody can help us. So she got a few inquiries that way. So she's working with those um, two people just to see if they can start a process of training. Yeah. I just want to say this, but do we need to look at their pay again? Uh, we'll be talking about it in there, um, in negotiations. I mean, yeah, I mean, it, it, we're, we're good, mm -hmm. but we're not, we're not the top anymore. You know, we were for a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, and there's, she shared with us an article about just what's happening in the school bus driver world across the nation. Um, and it's honestly, the, the mean age of most of the drivers around the country is like 57, 58. So we're looking at the reality of people are just aging up. And also, uh, it's hard. <laughs> like the job is really hard. And we we know how our teachers are feeling about being back in school and everything. We're, you know, being what it is. Um, the drivers are struggling just as much. Like 18 months, basically, of it being very a different structure for a while. And the kids coming back full on on the buses. There are people that have chosen not to drive because of medical concern. Also, with the fact that your buses are at not capacity, but they're pretty full as opposed to what we were doing last year. So there's a lot of there's a lot going on with us. And there's you know the commitment is strong. I mean they're yeah. not not requesting personal days. Yep. They're very you know the sick time obviously is what it is. You don't want anybody else coming in and driving, but they're really being cognizant of taking time or scheduling the appointments or different things. Not when they would have yeah. passed maybe at a different time. I think everybody appreciates the, the fact that they are we are so short staffed in that department. It's tough. Yeah, it, it is. It's hard. It's and it's everywhere. Did we get um, responses or decent responses on the opt out aspect? Not so much. No. No. And we we do have parents that are continuing to ask, you know, like I'm gonna be I'm gonna go away. I'd like to have my child on two different buses, and that's really, really hard because if you have to look at contact tracing and a student on one bus in the morning and one in the afternoon, you could be potentially knocking out two drivers, which we might not even be able to run, and then hurt a lot of students. So we're really trying to pull the line on that. If, if there's a major emergency or an you know, a hard, yeah. incredible hardship, we're looking at those cases, but you may get feedback that we're not honoring, you know, so some yeah. of those not being as flexible as we've been in the past, right? Yeah. It's, uh, yeah, it's hard. And, you know, you pray that whoever does have COVID is sitting in the back of the bus instead of in the middle of the bus. Because <laughs> it impacts lots of us. Literally, you have to think about where is this person sitting and how does it impact the world around them? And hopefully they're not behind the driver. You know that's that's a thing. That's that is truly how much of a um. We're almost better off in the front seat than Well, yeah, but if you have rock, if you have rock, right? <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um. Okay. There we go. Anything else? Our athletics are doing very well. Oh. Yes. Our our football team is. This has been one of their best seasons. They're ranked 18th in the state currently. Um, let's see, the field hockey team, our soccer teams, they're all going into open tournament at the end of the seasons. The field hockey team played last night against the uh, second grade teams in Class A, and they went into overtime, so they really held their own for that, which was great. The soccer, um, the golf championships are Saturday. We have two students, Michael Billing and Cheyenne Kucher, who qualified individually for the boys and girls. State championships, homecoming week, all of these um, varsity sports that played or um, competed won their matches. Oh, that was fun. Games. It was a great week. It was a great week. <laughs> it was a great week. <laughs> they, um, yeah, the fireworks were fun at yeah. uh, halftime, so yeah. that was nice. 
and let's see, the co-op volleyball team, the Mobile Stanford co-op volleyball team that was in Bitterford this evening. I don't have a score on that. Um, and this is their, tonight was their senior night. Uh, so, yep, so we're moving right ahead. Cross country still going well. Um, fall cheer had their senior night. So, yeah. So that's, that's our news. Where are we at on our student representative? Good question. Well, that's the question. Now, just one question. Um, this has been a different kind of meeting that we've had in a couple of weeks. So uh, I think there's been a lot of. Uh, I can certainly look for a student rep um, to have come in. Um, right. been, and I think it's important to have someone. Yeah, no, we don't disagree. Yeah. Right. We don't disagree. I think that we obviously know we're we're grateful for um, the way that this meeting was conducted tonight. So we're hopeful. I think, and we'll, we'll look at AJ and we'll say, "Send us somebody." Absolutely. Yeah. And so, just the last thing is, we wanted to talk a little bit about um, our our meetings being either live or we, we are going to make a recommendation at this point in time that the next couple of meetings we um, tape and, and in 24 hours after the meeting we um, put, it on the web, put it on the web, put it out. Um, we have noticed that on some Fridays after meetings we have um, some activity at the high school at our upper levels. And so we're just kind of looking to get back into our more um, consistent routine, and uh, therefore we'd like the next couple of meetings to to not be live. That is up to you guys to get up. Mm -hmm. How do people feel about that? I think it's a good idea. It's causing disruption, but also people that people miss the game and they don't have a chance to watch it live. Watch it time. Yeah. And they're always recorded anyway, so so even a live stream is then available after that. Um, but we've we've had, we've seen a lot of um, unfortunate ramifications on the following day at school, and we would like for that not to be the case. I yeah. I mean, I do think it's too bad because I know there are a lot of people who can't make it for work or other reasons. Mm -hmm. And I feel like it's sort of depriving them. Um, but maybe a temporary. Mm -hmm. Only for a day, though, right? You guys are talking about right. time for our Yeah. Oh, it's posted. So I think, uh, I think it's been a nice added advantage for our residents mm -hmm. to be able to be watching these lives because a lot of our people that want to pay attention to these have our parents that have kids in school that have kids that need to try and get to bed at a certain time so they can't come and sit here at our meetings until 9.30 at night. Okay. So being able to sit at home and watch it while they get the kids off the bed is very beneficial to them. Um, I so, don't like what I hear that takes place the next day. Yeah. Um, but I think that has to do with what was taking place here. And right. I think we can control that here by doing a better job of controlling it at this level. Yeah. And so I would say... Currently, at this moment in time, I just texted Chris to ask me to ask how many people are on. There's only six tonight. Yeah. So things have definitely. Well, what were we at earlier? Um, I don't know. I can ask him that. So, and three of those folks that were on were three administrators. Yeah. <laughs> so there's three, you know, and that's a, that's more of a typical thing. I think we we became. Um, for lack of a better word, reality television a little mm -hmm. bit. So, um, awesome. Let me see. If he's typing, so I'm going Are you listening? He's listening to me. <laughs> oh, um, he said there was 116 was the highest ever during the Mass City. And I do know also that staff have been able to, you know, participate or listen. And so, I mean, it's, it's really a, it's up to the drivers of the board. Right. We, we just, just wanted to, we wanted to put it out there because it was one of those things that um, um, 
and cause, cause some issues. I will, I'm going to say one more thing just on the behalf of Chris. Um, he's live with us every Thursday night. If we did record it, he wouldn't have to be live with us. And he could just like have a life on Thursday nights. Um, not that he can't do it to somebody else, but that's just my... I would be interested to hear if anything happens tomorrow after the meeting we've had tonight. Yeah, I would imagine that. I, I think well, and that's kind of where I wanted to go with it is we had two really rough, maybe three, yeah. really rough meetings here. And I think that's what involved the activity the next day. We've done this for a while now, mm -hmm. and we did have many activities after our live stream videos. Before, we'll so I think I, I think that we should continue doing what we're doing and do a better job of controlling what took place here, so that we don't have that mm -hmm. blow up the next day. So I would expect after today's meeting, you probably won't have many issues. Find out. Well, I mean, that's 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 we don't have any issues. We don't have any So I, I will say that my I actually the the Chris thing, Chris um, yeah. is actually fair. I, I think we should probably look at the whole live versus recording um, and maybe look at it more holistically in long term and decide. I agree that we need to do a better job of running meetings, and I also like we need to do a good public access for board meetings, but also what's reasonable. We're now out of the COVID emergency. We're open for in person. So maybe it's just a good time for us to look at, you know, what's our, like, I feel like since we, since COVID started, we've had TV stream, TV stream stopped live. Like we've gone through all of these things. So I feel like with the technology and where we are, this is just a good time to say, hey, what's our, what do we want to do for stream broadcasting of meetings? What's the best for, staffing and long-term, you know, the sure. overall. And if it's a 24 hour, then posting it, that makes sense. But I, I feel like we should look at it as like, what's, what, what does the board want to do as far as broadcasting meetings? Right. And that's, that's a great point. So, um, and we can, we can check in tomorrow with the, just what's going on around us in terms of the other districts, if they're just recording and putting up or if it's online, it just depends, I think, on each, each, town um and so like ectv had been with us but then and they really i think i'm not sure if they ran it live or if they just no, they, they just they recorded were, it no they were live for that Berwick. yes they were live in burrow yeah but then it's recorded yeah, for the rest of the world so i don't know i i, I would agree that uh, i think we need to look at kind of whether it's live or you're watching it the day after, mm -hmm. there's no audience interaction. Yeah. Right. So, so it's really not a big difference. And it, I mean, the idea is that if you want to participate live, we are open. Yeah. Here. Open, yeah. For yeah. Yeah. open for business. Open for business. Well, we can have we'll bring it up again. We're going to bring it up so that we can have more. Anybody have anything else? Somebody make a motion. Make a motion to adjourn. You always do. Second. <laughs> <laughs> All in favor. Thank you guys. Thank you guys for coming and listening. Thank you guys for coming.